Well, welcome to the Friday bubble. Such a gorgeous day, we're outside. No, no better a location to taste the new release of Cru Grand Cuvée, the 171st edition. The dominant year in this one is the 2015. Just for comparisons, I wanted to taste the previous vintage, and that's the one based on 2014, the 170th edition. So what is Grand Cuvée? There's really no better way to understand it today than look back at the founder. And back in 1843, when Joseph Krug founded the business, he, he over the, the following years, wrote down his works. And by 1845, he'd basically put down the recipe for Grand Cuvée, very simple one. He understood in Champagne that it was really difficult to make a Champagne every year from, from, that, from that year. So what he understood is that by blending in with reserve wines, you can make a fantastic champagne every year. The concept of Grand Cuvée is, is no more complicated than that. They pick the very best villages and they blend in eight to 10 previous years into the dominant year. So with this one, 2015, it's 42% um, reserve wines. And those reserve wines go back to the year 2000. As always with Grand Cuvée, it's uh, red grape dominant. That surprised me. I opened them um, an hour and a half ago because I wanted to give the champagne a little bit of chance to breathe. So all we do is we open them, um, put a stopper back in and pop them back in the fridge. And it really does make a huge difference. I think if you don't, if you open the champagnes and drink them straight away, I think you're missing a good chunk of the, the pleasure in the champagne. So with the red grapes in this one, we have 63% of which 18% um, of that is, is Mounier. It's a really fascinating grape um, at Krug because they, they, they make a prestige cuvee with this one and they use quite a lot of Mounier, but they're quite particular about the sites. And um, they have one of these beautiful vineyards in the village called saint Gem, And saint Gem is in the Valley de la Marne and it's, it's something quite unique about that gentle slope where they get these grapes from. They have the most beautiful fruit. And you can see, I've tasted the, the reserve wines a few times and they always stand out, astonishing fruit. So you have that lovely mix of dried fruit and fresh fruit. So you have some of the primary fruits, you can see a little bit of the lemony richness, but already in such a young champagne, you have some of these dried fruit characteristics coming through. Definitely the, 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 bitter, the bitter character from the lemon, the bitter orange you can really feel. And grapefruits, so you've got all, that, all those citrusy fruits. Um, and then you've got some of the oak impact. It's all barrel fermented, but obviously it's in older oak barrels. So the impact of the toasty oak isn't there. You just get some of the textural benefit on the palate. And um, you can smell the Chardonnay. You know, it's only 37% is Chardonnay, but you've got that little bit of yellow, that, that touch of definitely spicy pineapple in here, that's really rather attractive. Oh, that's a nice temperature today as well when I'm outside in the warmth. So you've got that, the texture from the oak, you can really see on the palate, that's beautiful. It just sort of, it really fills the mid palate. Some of the fruits I was describing on the aromatics, you can really see them. The orange is, is a delight always in Krug. I always find it quite refreshing. And then some of those yellow fruits, spiciness that comes underneath. Beautiful saline finish on this as I'm, as I'm talking to you. Based on 2015, we don't need to worry about what some people are calling the 2015 factor. It's not at all in the game on this one. So, so looks really good. Very good year. Um, little bit troubled in some of the months, so quite hot temperatures um, in August. And then it, 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 it cleaned up and September um, meant there was some, some, some really good grapes. Um, most people have declared it as a vintage. One of the things I think is fascinating about Krug, I was talking about, you know, how they make a great prestige cuvee every year. Is as an example, if you look at the 2012 vintage, 2012 was widely declared as a, as a, as a singular vintage by most houses. Krug have decided um, not to make um, any champagne from the 2012. Great year for many houses, 
and why do we think they've done that? It really is as simple as, as putting great, or the very, putting the very greatest reserve wines into their library. So all of their fruit from 2012 will benefit this program, which, which is fantastic. Very different um, year, 2014. Um, again, it came, came, came great late. And the last two weeks um, were, were, were pretty good. They had some issues in the Valley de la Man, so a lot of Mounier was really quite badly affected by by the rain, and um, was not was obviously not used. So Mounier, I think, is a little bit smaller in the percentages um, in the 170th edition. Let me just check the numbers. So, so it's roughly the same. Um, Pinot Noir, 38 percent, but just 11. Uh, percent of Mounier in this, so that that would reflect um, the harvest, which was tricky in the in the Valley de la Mar, which is a, a good source of, of Mounier. So let's have a let's have a look and see if we can compare the disgorgement data. And um, classically, they're a year apart, so one's released a year later. They're about twelve months from disgorgement, so we should, in theory, see a bit more of the dried fruit characteristics. Let's have a look. I'm just gonna pour myself. I'm too mean when I do these um, pourings. There we go. I think these glasses at a certain level, about, about optimum, about here. Now, interestingly, I think this one's a little bit more creamy, which I guess you would expect. There's a little bit of the patisserie coming through, you know, like that sort of slightly buttery characteristic. Hmm. Okay, so this one is actually a bit textbook. It's a, it's a year older, so it's had a bit more disgorgement time, and it's definitely showing some of those um, gorgeous um, fruits that start to come out um, when it's had a longer post disgorgement time. With Krug, especially the, these Grand Cuvées, I think they enter a drinking phase quite a long time after they they come out, and the the, the, the seventy one hundred seventy first edition. Really, it'll be at its, at its best in a minimum of five years. The, the 170 is still so, so young and vibrant and energetic. I rather love the Chardonnay. I think, um, I don't know whether it's true. No, so there's no difference. Um, there's 1% difference. The Chardonnay, perhaps because it's had more, more bottle age, is, is starting to show through and really shine. I love some of the energy that we're getting. Mm. and about the same amount of reserve wine. So 45% of reserves all the way back to 98, so a couple of years um, earlier. Today, actually, my favourite is going to be the 170th edition, purely because um, with that bit more post-disgorgement time, it's starting to fatten out. And um, as, as is what always happens, you start to get some of those dried fruit and rich sort of slightly patisserie notes coming through. So... Today I'm going to go for the one with a little bit more bottle age. They both have such beautiful fruit that, you know, we're talking minor favouritisms here. Well, I hope everybody gets a chance at home to drink the 171st edition. To me, it's tasting just a little bit richer because it's had a little bit more post-disgorgement time. Both are fabulous champagnes and I'm, I'm, I'm nitpicking the differences between them. Uh, both are, are fabulous. Cheers, everybody, and I hope you enjoy your weekend.